Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Yes Presents a Age as a Bridge, a conversation between me, Yvette Dion, and Akaya Winwood about the power of intergenerational connection. Thank you so, so much for joining us. As I mentioned, I'm Yvette Dion, the executive editor at Yes Media, a nonprofit reader-supported publisher of Solutions Journalism for more than 25 years. Yes is based in the Seattle area, which is the ancestral land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes. I invite you to read our full land acknowledgement on the about page of our website at www.yesmagazine.org slash about. As you saw when you registered for this event, all of our events are open to everyone, whether they can pay for a ticket or not. But so far in support of this event, many of you have already given, which will help keep our events and journalism open to all. By the end of this panel, I hope each one of you will be inspired to give whatever is meaningful to you to support the future of Yes's work. Before we begin, we have a few quick housekeeping items. First, we want to hear from you, so please post in the chat. But if you have questions, myself or Akaya, please put them in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, and we'll make time in the last 10 minutes or so of our program for our panelists to respond. In addition, we also have automated captions, which you can access by clicking the show captions button at the bottom of your screen. There will be a transcript available post-event, which will be emailed to all attendees. And finally, we are recording this event, and that recording will be made available later to everyone who has registered. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to begin this conversation with Akaya, who will share a little bit more about how we will proceed from here. Thank you, Yvette. Appreciate the, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So what we're going to be doing is having what I like to call a cross-generational emergent conversation. And that means that and I talked well, a week or so ago and got to know each other a little bit, but instead of giving each other the questions, we each formulated two or three questions for the other one, and the other one doesn't know what we're going to be asked. So we didn't, we haven't prepared for this. We have trust, we're trusting each other to be wise and to be thoughtful. And so none of this is scripted. And I think I'll start since I've got the mic right now. Yvette, when you think about it, what's the difference between being an old person and being an elder? Ooh, coming out of the gate, swinging. Well, Akaya. come on, girl. I think becoming old is something that if we're all privileged to do, it's something that happens. Like I always say, it's better than the alternative. You either get older or you pass away. So it's something that is a natural progression of the body to age and to get older, become an older person. I think becoming an elder is a choice. And by choice, I mean, not everyone who ages or becomes older chooses or opts into being an elder. An elder is really about using the wisdom that you have to really, I always say lift as you climb, to really help to pull of the people who are coming with you to share your wisdom, to share your knowledge, to take honor and joy and being at the head of whatever sort of family structure that you are in and to really want to pass that along to someone. And so that is less of a, we're all at an age and more of, but I'm opting into this purposely for a reason and whatever reason that may be, it's a choice rather than something that, that people are just naturally, it's like a naturally inherent thing. For everyone. Is there something you wanted to add to that, Akai, as well? To that idea? I think there's a responsibility that goes along with that, right? That, it, and one of the, it's tricky. One can't appoint oneself as an elder, right? Because the minute somebody says, oh, well, I've decided I'm an elder now, then I'm going, I've got stink eye for that. However, so I think it's a community given title that is both earned and chosen, right? And then once having earned it and chosen that label, it comes with a certain set of responsibilities, which is to look out for the best for everyone, right? And to tend to the ones who are coming after us and to 
you know, there's it's not a small task. So that's what I would add to that. I'm in complete agreement. I think my first question for you, it's like a broad question, so feel free to take it wherever you would desire. The thing that is really interesting to me is that in most of our Western society, so that includes ours, there's really this ongoing, I always say value, like this ongoing value that we place on an ability to resist aging. So the younger you are, the younger you look, it's always that idea, like you look as young as you feel kind of thing. So it's always about embracing a resisting agents in how we look and how we behave and how we work. My question for you is, how can we radically shift our relationship to aging so that we embrace what that means for our individual bodies, but also for our larger communities, rather than really clinging to this false idea of youth? Well, I think we would need to get rid of a couple of institutions. One, patriarchy. Two, capitalism. Because the combination of the two systems, you know, we're, it's understood that we're productive, right? It's, we have to be productive. And that makes capitalism go. So if we, as we age, if we stop being productive in a capitalistic context, then we have no value. And if we have no value, then that does all sorts of things to our self-esteem and how we take care or understand other people. So, um, and then you throw patriarchy in there where, you know, women are subserved, you know, what that is. So I think this is gendered. I think it is like there's a way that men gain power as they age and women lose power as we age. And, and that's not, that's a very broad statement. Let me just say that, right? It, and I've seen it happen. Although there are communities in, I think in the African-American community, women gain some power as we age. Right. And I know that that's true in some other communities as well. But I'm talking about the kind of free market, patriarchal, rampant capitalism that says you're only as good as you can produce something. And that would be money. So, you know, I'm watching these systems fall apart in front of my eyes. Right. I mean, it's I doubt that by the time if you were to have children, your children's children come of age, I doubt that the, the systems will still be intact. It could be wrong, but I've been talking to a lot of young ones and nobody's seeing these systems continuing for very much longer. So, yeah, I think the important thing will be to have some new interesting systems that are coming into being. We can't see them yet, but they're being created. I know you know that. Wherein that would just be silly, right? So that kind of ageist, only good in, in, until you stop producing. That though, nobody's creating that. So we'll see. That gives me hope. Gives me I'll tell you what, girl. I have so much hope, and the reason I have so much hope is because I'm having so many conversations with you know younger folks, and I'm going, oh, they're they're not. I mean, they're worried, right? Let's be clear. I'm not going to. But as a, I'm just in my conversations, people are dreaming some amazing things that I frankly couldn't dream, but I'm, I shouldn't be, right? You're going to be the ones to lead into it. So let me just stand beside you and go, go head on, go head on. Tell me what you need. Here's I love question. that. There's, I, um, before we get there, Kaya, there is one question I'm seeing from Raquel. That's a quick question from our Q&A. Since we were talking about age, would we mind sharing our ages? It's meaningful in this conversation and also a good opportunity to counteract the age of stigma, especially for women against claiming our years with pride. Excellent. Excellent. I am 67 and a half. <laughs> and I am a, a, a newly 34. I've been 34 now Great. for two months and very much looking forward to enjoying what 34 has to offer. And I love it's that people are now sharing their ages in the chat. That's fantastic. I, I love it. So I'm twice as old as you are, which is wonderful. Yeah, I say a half just because I remember being like four. People say, well, how old are you? And I'm four and a half like that. I mean, so I thought, well, why not? Okay. So in 40 years, you will be an elder and I will undoubtedly be among the ancestors. So what is your deepest heart's desire for our common fate? And what would you ask of my generation in order to help make that possible? Wow, what a question. Wow. I have to think through this. I'm thinking through this in real time. 
which is the, the benefit of having this sort of conversation. In 40 years, I'll be in my 70s for me, God willing. My hope for our collective fate is that we want to have a planet to reside on would be really, really nice. A planet that we are in deep community with, that we collectively and individually take care of, that we have corporations that are not extracting from our earth in the way that they are now and that we're able to remain here. So that that's my first and foremost. But I also desire a world where I often talk about and think about social movements as movements for dignity, to give people from marginalized communities, whatever we consider a marginalized community in the time that they're in, their fight for dignity, for dignity to be treated as a whole person, to be tr treated as an equal partner in the society that we're building. And so my hope for our collective fate is that we have dismantled these systems that prevent us from achieving that goal. So that, as you mentioned, is patriarchy, it's capitalism, it's ableism, it's homophobia and queerphobia, it's ageism, that we are all able to be together around the issues that we are concerned about and that we have found solutions for those issues. Now, I'm not naive. I recognize that progress will take longer than 40 years. I think a lot about how long it took our country's religious right to overturn Roe v. Wade. It was a 50-year process. I think about the abolition movement to abolish slavery, it's hundreds of years. I think about the suffrage movement, hundreds of years, civil rights movement, decades and decades. So I'm not naive, but that is my North Star of hope, that we live in the society that we desire to live in. And I think my ask of people who are currently elders in that is to one, embrace younger people and teach us how to be elders, teach just how to show up in our communities. I think because we cling so tightly to this idea of being young, suddenly you wake up and you're an older person and don't really know how to show up in the way. Like it, it just feels like you've just been pushed aside, that you're not valued, you're not valuable anymore. How do you show up as an elder? Learning that I think is, is imperative and that we all no matter our ages, put our ego aside and figure out how to do things collectively. These, I spend a lot of time in digital spaces, these kind of intergenerational battles, blame games that we do for each, it's not actually servicing us and serving us as we're aiming to achieve these collective goals. And so pushing that aside, teaching one another how to show up, being in community with one another, not coming in with all of this pride and this ego about, well, in my day kind of thing, doing it all together would be my ask. Yeah, actually, you know, I'm not sure that it's going to take 200 years to get, I used to think mm. that, right? I really yeah. did. I used to start think, okay, in, you know, seven generations or uh, whatever that might be. I have to say that I think it's going to happen sooner than that. It I'm works. so hopeful. Yeah. Well, and it's partly because I, I've been asking people, I guess the youngest was 2018 and the eldest, oldest one was like 52 to close their eyes and imagine themselves my age and what was happening with the natural world and what was happening with humans and all the things. And I, I probably asked this of 80 or so folks all over the world and I'm getting the same answer i'm getting the same it's mm -hmm. that we live collectively mm -hmm. that we work and collectively we're doing something together that the natural world is uh, healing that the children are happy it, it has been so remarkably consistent what i'm hearing from folks and realizing if they're seeing that in their lifetime then this you evolution that you're talking about in my language might happen in the next 40 to 50 years. So I thought, well, I can either keep my 300 year time frame or listen yeah. to my younger ones. Think it happened. What if it happens in your lifetime? It changed the way I work in the world. I went, okay, so if 
if the possibility is that this shift happens in your lifetime, and I might see the very first moment of it, I'm going to do all I can to bring this, help this happen faster than I would have anticipated. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That infuses me. I always, I love the phrase by Miriam Kaba, an abolitionist organizer, that hope is a discipline. And I feel like this, this conversation is filled with hope. It does my heart good, as I often say. My question is, is kind of in alignment with your previous question. I'll flip it just a little bit because I think historically, like those who get to have their stories told, which is different than those who are actually involved, but those who are credited, those who get to have their stories told with being involved in social media, uh, social movements or leading social movements in any social movement you want, you want to think of from abolition to suffrage to civil rights to Black power, any movement. The people who are often credited are young folks. But I think that you and I both know and our collective group that we're speaking with that no movement is led by an individual, like they are always led by a collective and everyone within that collective has something to offer no matter what demographic they are coming from. And so my question for you is as we embrace the movements of this time, which we previously mentioned, whether that's like to end police violence against all people, especially Black people, or climate justice, or this movement for trans rights. What do you see the role of elders to be? And how can we build an intergenerational social movement that elevates every generation's strengths? So I was talking with a friend of mine who was in her 40s at the time. And this was a couple of years ago. And I said, you know, I think it's time for people my age to step aside and just get out of the way. And she said, oh, no, no, do not step aside, step beside us. And I said, well, tell me, what do you mean? She said, well, we need you. We need elders to support us, to be in the movements with us, to give us their offer, their wisdom, et cetera. So we don't need, we don't want you to step aside, but we do want you to get out of the way. And I said, oh yeah, especially we boomers. And because we've been used to having center stage, we've been used to running all sorts of things and I'm not disrespecting that. And it really became clear to me that I needed to shift my role from being center stage to supporting you and those who are making change now. And that's a different role. And frankly, I love it, right? I really love it because you can see things I can't see appropriately, right? So I love standing. I actually think about it, not standing beside, I just slightly behind you so you can lean on me if you need to, right? That you know I'm here. You know that I'm interested. You know I've got your back, literally, and have learned some stuff, right? We've learned some things. So we can say, oh, there's a caution here, right? The trick is to listen to one another, right? And so I've had to, which I'm going to go into my next question, because this leans right into this notion of, I came of age back in the 70s. It was very binary. You were male, you were female. You were black, you were white. You were straight, you were gay. That's it. All the other things too, right? And so in my conversations with younger folks over the years, I've had to shift my thinking quite a bit. And that has been uncomfortable. Some of it I did not like because I was so sure that I knew how it was, right? But that's how it was in my coming up. Now everything is much more fluid and much more ambiguous. Recently I heard that, oh, there are more than 700 genders. And I'm like, what do you mean 700 genders? What do you mean? How many do we need? How about a dozen? But then I'm, so I'm having to like, oh, well, okay, let me think about that, right? So why is it important that this, why is this ambiguity and fluidity important? And what would you say to someone who is deeply unsettled by these changes? Mm, I absolutely love this question. And I, I'm going to share a little bit personal here of why I love this question. For 33 years of my life, I knew inherently that I was queer. 
And I lived in a world that told me that was not possible for me to be Black, incredibly progressive, a very noted, out, vocal Black feminist, and be queer and have heart failure. And now I'm out and and proudly queer and in in a queer relationship. And what that has enabled me to have is a freedom. Like I feel very individually free to be who I am and to show up as I am and to say that none of that distracts from my worldview or my political commitments to create the world that we desire. And I think when we don't allow for that nuance or we don't, in typical electoral politics, they say make a tent big enough, which I'm not, not one fond of that language Two, I don't think it speaks to the, what they're actually trying to say, which is regardless, there are some differences that it's not possible for us to get over. If you believe inherently that I, as a Black person, deserve less rights than you. We can't get past that. But if there are nuances in a debate or in a conversation, if I shut you out, but we both have the same end goal here, something that that more broadly affects our collective in a positive way, we have to be able to move past that. We have to be able to be together because when, otherwise, if you're being exclusionary, it prevents us from coming together to do work, which is why that nuance is so important. And I also think self-definition is incredibly important. To be able to say your pronouns are Z, to be able to self-define in that way and put that on your birth certificate, on your license, whatever it is, on your documents. For some people, if you've not had the experience of feeling as if there's a disconnect between your mind and your body. Don't understand how empowering that is to step and to say, this is who I am. So for people who struggle with that, one, I think it's important to allow people to identify the way that they choose to, flat out, thousand percent. If my partner is transgender, when he comes into a space, he wants to be identified as he, we use he, no exceptions. Anything other than that is contentious for the point of being contentious, right? Everyone gets the right to self-define. I also think it's important to embrace that kind of nuance of humanity, truly, to embrace that nuance of humanity, of being trans or being queer or however you identify is not a new thing. No. We just have a microphone to speak about it. We just have the platforms to speak about it. We have the ability because of social media and technology to meet and and greet and identify with people and build community with people with a likeness that was much more difficult before that time. This is an existence that's existed for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And if we see it as that, as like a natural arc of history. There have always been multiple genders. We've always been able to identify in different ways. I think it allows us to not ignore that. That's an essential part of who someone is, is how they identify, but not allow it to be an impediment to our progress, an impediment to us collectively coming together toward whatever our political aims are, our political goals are. I think we need to factor in the fact that some folks are very afraid of the ambiguity, right? That's just true. And so we can have political rhetoric and that has its place. But to like, I have a good old friend who is a radical feminist and she's been in the movement forever and she cannot, she cannot get beyond the binary gender thing. And I've had to, you know, we've had a couple of conversations about it and I'm choosing not to have any more of them because they're not a good, you know, waste, they're not a good way, uh, use of my time. But I, I watch her be re- somehow or other very threatened by that, right? So then I have to go, okay, so I'm going to have some compassion for that fear. I know that that's not a conversation we're going to have. And I want to, if she knows she wants to come along, she can call me and we can talk about it, right? 
so it isn't such a, I think we need to be, you know, it's tricky. In your earlier statement just now, you said, well, if they feel like somebody feels like Black people don't, shouldn't get all the things, then I don't have, then I, I can't, that, that's at the end of the conversation. As a Black person, I agree with you. As a human, I'm wondering who's going to bring them along? Where are the opportunities for growth, right? And it might be that I turn to a, rent, uh, a white person, say, could you bring them along? Because that's not my work, you know, and then to be clear about what's my work, but to not give up on each other. Again, assuming that we're not keeping ourselves in toxic situations, right? Because there was a time where I would have been where she was, where my friend, I was at where she was, right? And I had to like, what, get really uncomfortable and go, okay, things are changing. Oh, I'm often misgendered, Right. I, especially in airport restroom, I can promise you that I walk into a restaurant, rest airport restroom, and somebody almost always calls me sir. And so I, I realized that's always been true. And so I went, okay, so it's not a polit. It, it, certainly, there's politics in it, but what if? And I noticed that as the trans movement got more and more of a microphone, my life got easier because there was room for me to not look in a particular way. So peace around having deep compassion for each other as we, particularly cross generations, I've come to believe that this divide, these, this generational divide is more problematic, I think. Now, let me put it in a more positive way. We need to bridge this generational divide of oh, okay boomers and the, oh, the millennials who don't want to go to work and all the stuff that's just nonsense. Because if we don't come together across generations, it's going to interrupt all of our social movements. But we're gonna, we really do need each other. I got off my soapbox. I, I was no, I'm I'm gonna agree with that and just say I am not a person who believes in throwing people away. I, I don't. don't. I know that. And that girl, girl, you're the editor of Yes Magazine. You no, you don't throw anybody <laughs> away. Come on. I don't throw anybody away. You now don't... there are some people I'm like I may not be able to be on the same island yes. with you. Yes. I can't be on the same island with you, but also I'm not going to throw you away, which is like a nuance that I think it sometimes gets lost. Yes. It sometimes get lost. My last question for you, and then we'll make time for, for questions in the chat. As a reminder, please drop questions in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. You can continue to communicate with one, with one another in the chat for the actual questions go in the Q&A box so that we can navigate them. My last question for you, Akaya, and again, very broad, you can take it wherever you would like. What would it look like to center marginalized communities? So Black people, Indigenous folks, people with disabilities, people in the communities we were just talking about, the LGBTQ plus community, in our conversations and our advocacy around both aging and becoming elders. It's beginning to happen. When I think about in my 20s and 30s, none of that was mentioned. We might mention people of color, right? Maybe. But there was not the kind of awareness of these, that there were even people in the world who were trans, or we had terrible language for people with disabilities, or whatever it was, right? It's been a recent phenomenon that those, what you call marginalized, folks have been noticed, right? Let alone centered. So if we're, I believe that it's important to recenter ourselves. And what I'm looking for is a world or dreaming about is a world in which no one is marginalized and everybody's in the center. So I see this movement to be inclusive in these ways. Let's call out these communities that they're in the margins. Let us pay attention there. I I see that as corrective and a strategic step toward a society in which people are, are just humans, humans among the natural world, that there's no distinction sort short of, you know, function between me and my orange tree, that somebody's going to go, oh, yeah, look, beautiful Akaya, beautiful orange tree, because I know, because I see it every day, that we're the same. What I don't want is people come plucking things off me and eating them. But 
Short of that, I want to have us be related to the world, the natural world, to each other, and that it's all in the center of things. And maybe that's too idealistic, but that's the world I'm working to. Very much saying. It's the dream and it's the goal. I would say it's the North Star of what we're aiming for. Right. Absolutely. Okay, are you ready to take some questions? Sure. Tell me to cue them up. I'm going to cue them up. I don't mind okay. asking questions as we go. And if we are able to answer your question, we will answer it live. So we'll click in that Q&A to say that we are answering live. I will start with this question from Paul Thompson. Hi, Paul. The question is, and of course, Akaya, you can answer it in, in whichever way you please. And I'm going to reframe this question. How are both yes, which I can answer to this, and third act, reaching out to conservatives to build a more robust conversation? Well, I can't speak. I'm not going to speak for third act. I guess I kind of sort of have to. So uh, B and all the people, don't get angry with me if I'm wrong. There's no barrier saying you can't come here right? We're very clear about our values. I think I represented uh, Third Act's values in what I've been saying today. And we're clear about those things. And so anyone who wants to come play is welcome. And we're, we're completely committed to that. So we're not, ooh, I don't love this language. I was about to say targeting. Eesh. Okay, I need to pull that out of my vocabulary. We're not pushing any particular group to come along. We're very aware of demographics. Let's be clear, you know, people over 60 in these United States are 71% are white people, right? And since that is our, you know, 60 come uh, 60 and older come along, we're very aware of our demographics, right? And it's been interesting for me to, my work has been in communities of color uh, all from, from the gate, right? In various ways, right? So all of a sudden I'm going, oh, we're organizing old white people. These are now my people. And I've had to kind of go, well, that's interesting because that hasn't been where my work has taken me before. But so would a conservative come to Third Act and find community? Maybe, maybe. I hope so. How about you? I'm in complete agreement. I don't think, and I don't want to speak entirely for yes. So if there are folks from yes, please feel free to, to chime in, in in the comments. I think our values are very clear. And our mission is very clear to ignite people into creating this world. And those who are like-minded tend to gravitate toward those missions and values. But there isn't an explicit, no, you are not welcome. That, that's not what's happening at YES. Instead, what we're asking is, here are some solutions for you that will, one, reach the most marginalized among us, and then the goal is if it can reach the most marginalized among us, then most likely it can be replicated. Here's what you can do. Here's what you individually can do. And that has very, very little to do with what your electoral politics are. But what I've learned is there's a very clear relationship sometimes between your value, your values individually and collectively and those politics where the solutions to you may seem, not to you, might seem as if they're not in alignment with your values. And so what I encourage people to do is to do self-interrogation of why that is. That's what I'm always encouraging is self-interrogation of why are you uncomfortable? What is it that's standing in the way of embracing these solutions? What is the impediment for you? And if you can do that self-interrogation, I found there's a lot of work a lot of work that you'll get more involved in because you've done that self-interrogation work. Yeah. We think the same, you know, that folks, we've, we've been having trouble keeping up with the interest, right? Um, we went from zero two years ago to over 70,000 members now. And that's, a, every once in a while I think about that, I just want to weep for our staff who's been amazing to this. Um, they have. <laughs> I'm going, Thank God I'm not running anything anymore. So what I do think is everybody needs us. Everybody needs people, right? Isolation, humans do not do well in isolation. And so not everybody needs third act, I'm not saying that, but we need each other, right? And so having a platform, whether it's yes or third act or any number of things that say you're welcome here, I, people need that. 
And I actually think about when I think about conservative people, I know a lot of conservative people who disagree with me politically, but who would never want to, who are not authoritarian. And I think we need to make a distinction there, right? So, but even the, the authoritarian movements, I think are a way for people to actually belong somewhere. And I have compassion for that because we need to belong. Absolutely. The form of seeking connection. I truly believe that a thousand percent. Um, another question that we have in our Q&A is how do we address the bias and discrimination toward elder generations in society? I work with the Grandmother's Village Project and see a lot of bias against our elders. Why don't you go first? Gladly. I think ageism, like every other ism and phobia, is a system. And so in a society that values youth at the expense of people who are aging, you are going to encounter ages. And I think one of the ways in which we can address that bias and that discrimination, honestly, is in our workplace laws of how we hire. If you're in an organization where we do unconscious bias trainings about various different identities, but very rarely are we doing that unconscious bias training around aging. And so we have to begin to root that out in our various systems, very much the way in which we do racism and fat phobia and all of the phobias. And that starts in the systems themselves of that self-interrogation work. It's an interrogation of your policies, your procedures. Are you ensuring that you're hiring people of a certain age? Etc. Any thoughts there, Kaya? I do. I have a couple of thoughts. One, I, this is where race comes into play or culture comes into play, right? I was in a conversation years and years ago with a white woman and we were talking about aging. This was before either of us were anywhere close to, to 50. And she was talking about her fear of getting older because of ageism, right? And the, the marginalization, all the things we've talked about. But I found myself going, I'm not afraid of being older. And I thought, why is that? And I made reference to this earlier. I have found, and it is true, my lived experience is that as I get older within my African-American community, I actually gain power. I actually, I can talk to any young Black person and they're going to give me some respect. And I know it, right? And I, I mean, I'm very aware. I feel it all the time, right? That's so, how we are raised. That's we how are we're raised, raised that way. That's right. So I can look at a young Black man who might be, I'd be like, what are you thinking? And he'll go, oh, okay, yeah, right? Or whatever. It's part of my responsibility as an elder, right? And there are other communities in which I know people, again, gain cultural power as they age. In a lot of indigenous cultures, that's the case, right? But as a society, as a United States culture, under the things we've talked about, the systems that we talk about, yeah, it, it's hard on to get old here, which is, I think, why people want to do anything but that, right? Let me get all the stuff, the plastic surgery, and I'm not really judging any of it because I get why somebody... I looked in the mirror the other day and went, oh, my chin could, and I thought, Akaya, right? <laughs> what am I worried about my chin when this is my work, right? So it's embedded, even in those of us who can escape some of it culturally. Yeah, we, I think you're right. I think it's about how do we create laws that say we cannot discriminate according to age and all the things that, that, we, that needs to be included in those, those policies. I am in complete thousand percent agreement. I see several questions about the chat. The chat is going to be saved by the Yes staff, and I'm assuming will also be sent out. So if you've asked that question, there is your answer. This question is from Rita, and it says, what should we keep in mind when working with younger activists to promote being heard and political insights being considered. And the, the uh, example that Rita is pointing to specifically is organizing around the conflict in Gaza for Palestinians. First of all, we need to listen to one another. I'm going to walk around this question for a minute and come back to it. Um, I was recently uh, hosting a cross-gen conversation at the hall and it was wonderful. And after the conversation was complete, we all, the panelists and I, 
went and had lunch together. And in it, they started to talk about sexuality. And without going into any great detail, because lack of time, they were talking about things that I felt, and I think I am a strong feminist, been, you know, out about my sexuality, all the things. They started talking about things that made me go, what? You wait a minute, you do that with who? And I mean, I was just kind of sitting there, not, I mean, I'm exaggerating my facial expressions a little, but that's what I was going on inside of me. And I said, hold, a couple times I said, hold up, y'all, hold up. I need to catch up with you because you're way ahead of me. And they were sweet and we laughed and all of that. At the end of it, I said, thank you for allowing me to be part of this conversation. And all I did was listen and ask a few questions. And they said, thank you for listening. And I said, well, of course. And they said, oh, no. Are the people who are older than us, we could never have this conversation with our parents or the people that we know who are older than us because they would tell us we're wrong, that that's not the way to see things, that they, you know, that that this is just messed up and you didn't do that. And I went, wow. And these were people I didn't know, right? These are these weren't people that I had selected, right? So same thing here. How can we listen without presupposing or making the other one wrong or not just because we th see things differently. We can't do the righteous, the binary, right, wrong, let's assign blame, let's determine that these are the good people and these are the bad people. This is such a convoluted situation. Having been there a number of times, I can guarantee you that this complicated situation is not two months ago, as most of us know, right? So to sit and have the, let our triggered selves go for a minute and listen to one another and stop assigning blame. That feels really important to hear. How about you? I am in complete agreement about not assigning blame. And in addition to that, I always think it's really imperative. I learned this a long time ago, and it's something that I carry throughout my life. Nothing is personal. Typically, when people are talking about issues that are concerning them or, or things that have happened, it's not directed at you individually. It's often directed at the broader system that, that we are addressing. Usually what people are saying is not personal to you. And if you're able to step out of that realm of personally being offended by something, unless it's directed individually at you, you can often foster incredible conversations that expand thinking for both people or for a group of people. And so when I learned to not take anything personally, it made a, a world of difference for me. What I came to understand is in approaching those conversations, people are bringing a million other things that have nothing at all to do with you individually. It's their history and it's so many other things. And when you're able to step out of that realm, it, you can have amazing dialogue, expansive, generative conversation. We are coming up oh, on the end. Oh, go ahead, Akaya. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm totally, I, yes, I mean, for real. And that's harder to do than, you know, it's a hard thing to do to not take things personally, right? Absolutely. I have, I've lost a couple of people who are dear to me in the conflict. And, and so one point was a, oh, that's happening over there is now in my house, right? Right. And so I'm grieving some folks, right? That then makes it harder for me to not take it personally. But so we also have to compassion as we don't take it personally when we get people who are activated. I understand it. Absolutely. I want to ask these last two questions to you because they all are focused on third act. I, I want to ensure that you have time to speak about third act. We had several questions about, can you share more about third act itself for those who are unfamiliar? And then a subsequent question from Jill about how has third act been successful in engaging with younger folks? Oh, well, yes. Okay. So third act is organized to uh, organize all people over 60 around democracy and climate and all the things in between. So there's racial justice in it. There's all that, right? And it really is a, a way for people to have a platform to come either back to the work of social change for those who went off and had lives and, and families and all the things and going, I'm ready to come back to it or for people who've been in the work for the whole time. So, you know, it's thirdact.org. Come check us out.
What was the second question, girl? The second question was how has Third Act been successful in engaging with younger folks? It has been so much fun. So here's the deal. We're two years old. We're celebrating our second year this month. We have been trying to manage the interest of the older folks, right? And at the same time, I can't tell you how often young people come up and say, I want to be part of that. How can I get engaged? So that's a stay tuned. We're figuring that out. And I'm particularly interested in that, um, which is why I'm hosting these cross with those. I do cross gen conversations with through Third Act because I believe we got to do this together. We have to do this together. I think that is the ultimately the message from Akaya and myself that we have to do this together. So we've had so many great conversations happening in the chat and in the Q&A, which we will share in a follow-up email with everyone who registered for this event. We will also send out a link to the recording and publish it on yesmagazine.org in the next couple of weeks, along with the transcript of this conversation. In the meantime, I hope you'll check out the elders issue. If you don't already have a copy, you can join our monthly supporters at yesmagazine.org slash donate, and you'll get a free ongoing subscription to Yes. Every day at Yes, we seek to elevate hope, provide inspiration, and offer solutions for a better world. This work and these events are only possible thanks to generous gifts from our community of change makers. I'm inviting you to visit yesmagazine.org slash donate if you'd like to make a gift in support of our work. And thanks to all our current supporters who are determined to create a more equitable, compassionate, and sustainable world. Thank you so much to everyone here for joining us, and may you all have a joyful rest of your day. Goodbye.